Hey, how's it going, everyone? Um, there's Joel over there. He's my fellow OpenBCI co-founder. Um, so first off, thanks a lot to Culture Hub and the Volumetric Society for helping pull this all together. It's uh, really good. This is our first uh, kind of uh, promotional physical outreach since the launch of our Kickstarter, which is going really well. So don't forget to check it out. Um, so before I continue, I kind of want to do a little bit of querying of the audience. Um, who here has worked with brain computer interfacing before? Maybe about 10%? Cool, that's good. Um, how many artists do we have in the crowd? Roughly the same amount. And researchers? Okay, strong showing. How about developers? It's computer scientists? Okay, cool. It's a nice mix then. That's great. Um, okay, so let's continue. So we are here presenting OpenBCI, and our mission is to crowdsource brain research and innovation. Uh, next slide. So what is BCI? Um, big old question mark over our logo. Um, can you, next slide. So BCI stands for Brain Computer Interface. Next slide. And so a brain computer interface is really any means of taking information or data or imaging from the brain and translating it into something that a computer understands and can make sense of. And so this is this nice cute little graphic that was actually done by Augustino over there um, for kind of visualizing what's, what's possible with you know, linking the brain to something that can translate it or relay it into a signal that a, that a computer can understand and then the computer having outputs to control other things, which is you know, the eventual goal of this whole endeavor. Uh, next slide, please. So there's, there's a lot of types of brain-computer interfaces right now that exist, and they range from, they're, they're generally classified from invasive to non-invasive. Um, so here we have an example of electrodes being placed directly on the surface of the brain, which is obviously not as safe, it's a little bit riskier. Uh, and that's, that's referred to as electrocorticography. Then there's fMRI, which is a little bit less invasive, but it requires you going inside of a machine that weighs a lot and uh, takes a lot of time. And then on the least invasive end of the spectrum, we have EEG, which is what we're gonna be focusing mainly on with our presentation. And there's, even when it comes to EEG, there's a large spectrum inside of EEG, ranging from medical and research and academic grade EEG equipment to commercial EEG, which is what you can get you know, as an everyday person or as a developer. Uh, next slide, please. So EEG is the measuring of electric potential from various points on the scalp, and it can range from anywhere, anywhere from using a single electrode to up to 256 electrodes. And um, generally, it's, it's sampled at a, at a sample rate, and then the signal or the voltage is looked at over a period of time. And what, what researchers or what people are looking for is, is a fluctuation in this voltage over time that produces a waveform. And these waveforms can be um, analyzed using uh, signal processing techniques or data analysis techniques, commonly FFT or Fast Fourier Transform, which is also used in analyzing audio. Um, but these are ways of classifying brain waves into power bands or frequency ranges, which are then used to be uh, connected to various states of mind or, or, or activities or um, stimuli that, that produce certain brain activity. Uh, next slide, please. So before I continue, or, or what I'd like to do is show you a really cool video that kind of, it touches on a lot of different applications of brain computer interfacing that have already happened. Um, and I'm gonna talk over it. Ooh, go lower left. Okay, cool. So here we have um, a woman that has, a, has an electrode grid actually implanted into her brain. And she's a fully quadriplegic, but these researchers at Brown built this system that allowed her to actually drink coffee, which is pretty wild. And now this is a brain-controlled car, which they didn't test on real street, but they got it working in a parking lot uh, using classifiers to detect motor cortex of the brain. And here's a quadcopter controlled by a researcher at a university. This is a, a toy that this group Puzzlebox built, and here we see the, the introduction of brain-computer interfaces into gaming. 
Um, so this is World of Warcraft for those of you that don't know. Um, but this uh, researcher down here and developer built this interface to play the game and control the characters and have them do actions in, in the, the virtual world. Uh, here's one of the cheapest EEG systems that you can buy and it's a toy that measures attention. Um, this is the introduction of brain computer interfacing into art. Here this group uh, with a project called Neuro Knitting, they would record brain waves in real time and have it stitch, uh, what, stitch the brain wave into a scarf. And here, as Ellen mentioned earlier, actually, this is the Ascent, which was uh, a project in Brooklyn, I believe, in the Navy Yard. And it was a, a levitation generated by brain waves. Excuse me, can you step back to the steps? Sure. Oh, sorry about that. And then here we have some quantified self uh, initiatives to track brain waves and get feedback about your state of mind. So you can see that brain computer interfacing has made its way into a lot of different domains. Um, So next slide. So what's the catch? It looks like brain-computer interfacing can already do all this really cool stuff, and so why, you know, why create open BCI? Why open source it? Uh, next slide, please. So there's this equation that I came up with that I think defines the brain-computer interfacing uh, existing design challenges, which is that the functionality of a brain-computer interface is equal to one over its usability. Um, next slide. So here's a great example of a very happy gentleman. Uh, he's probably the only happy gentleman that's ever worn 256 electrodes on his head. Um, but you can see now that if you're looking for a lot of really good data, it becomes pretty cumbersome pretty quickly if, you, if you're looking for a lot of samples, or a lot of sample nodes. Next slide, please. So here's this graph that actually, you can't really see the bottom of it, but the, the x-axis is usability, and the y-axis is functionality. Sorry, I'm stepping forward again. Um, and here you have this, this kind of array of existing, com existing brain computer interfaces ranging from research to um, commercial. And the truth is, is I, you know, this is kind of this thesis I've come up with, is that brain computer interfacing has not been pushed into the practicality range. And so what we have is all of these, these units that go from somewhere on the functional range to somewhere on the usability range. Um, so next slide. So I think that what brain-computer interfacing needs in order to become something that people actually take seriously and people use in everyday life is some initiative somewhere on the spectrum that pushes brain-computer interfacing into the practical range. Um, next slide. So here I, I started to create a list of design challenges of brain-computer interfacing. And I know this is way too much text on one slide, but the point I'm trying to make is that there are almost an infinite number of design challenges that go into the data flow from you know, a neuron discharging an electron to something that a computer outputs. And the truth is, is that, that, that um, all of those design challenges can't be solved by a single institution or a single field of science. And what's really exciting is that we have this ability to crowdsource and open source problems now where you can get people from a lot of different disciplines working on the same problem together. Um, so next slide. So that's where OpenBCI comes in, is we're hoping that by you know, getting people together and, and, and creating a forum for discussion that includes people of every single dis discipline, from artists to scientists to developers to researchers, that we can start to solve some of the biggest problems in brain-computer interfacing. Uh, next slide. So that is segue into OpenBCI, an open source brain computer interface. Uh, so this is kind of just something I came up with, but I really like to think of our initiative as, you know, we're, we're trying to lower the barrier of entry to brain computer interfacing and also provide a building block. So we're not, we're not trying to offer a solution, but what we're trying to do is give a very, very simple, but very, very powerful building block that people can click together and, and and build upon and, and iterate with that you know, drives forward innovation and research in, in this domain. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is the Kickstarter video, and I think it'll do a really good job, better than I can do in the amount of time, explaining what we're up to. Hi Kickstarter, I'm Connor. And I'm Joel, and we're bringing you OpenBCI, 
an open source, low cost EEG system for makers. We want to lower the barrier of entry for brain computer interfacing enthusiasts. When you support OpenBCI, you get a Bluetooth enabled EEG system for makers. It's going to have an Arduino on board and it's fully programmable. But it's not just about EEG. Your body outputs all kinds of electrical potentials that we can measure with OpenBCI. So we're also going to be providing a biopotential suite for sensing ECG and EMG. That's heartbeat and muscle movements. There's a lot of EEG platforms out there, but most of them are closed in some way or another. Either they do not allow you to put the electrodes where you want them to be, or the data is not accessible, and so it makes it very hard to do what you really want to do with the system. To get started, you need a computer. An OpenBCI board. Some cables and electrodes. And a brain. First, download the OpenBCI code examples and libraries from our GitHub. Second, upload the Arduino code just like you would any other sketch. Third, launch the OpenBCI Brainwave Visualizer. It has been ported to a number of open source software platforms. Fourth, apply the electrodes to your head and connect your brain to your computer with OpenBCI. Then, see your brainwaves in real time. So here we have the OpenBCI Brainwave Visualizer. It's connected to Connor's head. And right now you can see some eye blinks going by in the time domain spectrum here on the right. And we have an FFT plot on the left. A map of the electrodes, you can see the numbers corresponding to the waves here on the right. The two in the front are receiving most of the eye blink artifact. Connor, grit your teeth a little bit. You can see that the EMG artifact is showing up here across almost all the channels. So a good way of, uh, of doing a test here with the EEG signal, making sure we have got all the connections we need is if Connor closes his eyes, which he's doing now, we should see a high frequency or high amplitude uh, alpha wave, which is in the 10 hertz band, which is what we're seeing down here in the FFT plot. I think what makes OpenBCI different than what's currently available is that you have full access. Full access to the data, full access to the algorithms, full access to the configuration of the hardware. And this opens up so many possibilities to explore what can be done in the brain-computer interface field. We see a variety of different people being interested in this coming from different backgrounds. So, you know, typically EEG and brain-computer interfaces are, at least historically, they were, they were set in research and academic settings, but now there's this movement to bring the technology out of the academic setting, out of the research setting, and give it to just an everyday person. And so we see artists, creators, computer scientists just using this as more of a hobby thing than, than actually a research grade EEG, even though it's just as powerful. I'm a neuroscientist, and I've been trained that way for the past 10 years. As such, my thinking about neuroscientific questions is, in a way, bounded. And the more people that you can bring to the table who are interested in the same questions, but who have different expertise, different training, different knowledge base, the more creative, uh, new, innovative ideas you're gonna be able to come up with. We've been prototyping the hardware all summer long, and we really feel like it's at a point now where we can really start to share it. We're here at ThoughtWorks today with our first hackathon, bringing people together, software programmers, hardware engineers, people with general interest to share ideas and help push OpenBCI forward to make it accessible for everybody. As we're walking around, we're constantly labeling the world around us as interesting or uninteresting, things that you care about or you don't. Um, and there's a signal associated with that that we recognize in the laboratory, but we don't know what it looks like in the real world, where you're walking around, where you're moving your eyes freely. Um, and something like OpenBCI gives you a chance to um, see what those signals look like in the world where you really want to use them. Currently, brain-computer interfaces, they have a lot of amazing implications. It's just that not enough people are using them. And so our mission is to not only sell a product, but 
teach people how to use this product and host hackathons and meetups and share knowledge about brain computer interfacing. So thanks Kickstarter. We really hope that you support our project. What's your Kickstarter goal? Uh, 100K. And we're 50% we're there. So. Very good. When did you start your Kickstarter? We launched it last Wednesday, so we're doing we're on a really good pace right now. Right, and um, how long are you going to have it up? Through January 22nd. Okay. Why obviously? Why obviously about anything? What artists can contribute to this project? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, think differently. I think that uh, exactly. I think artists, um, you know, can can take the, the data and visualize it and re represent it in ways that engineers can't. Especially, especially one, one design challenge is <clears throat> making it so people who don't have a background or an education in this can understand it. And visual learning, a lot of people are visual learners and I think that artists have a strong role to play in actually um, making people understand how these systems work. Um, so, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. We'll do Q and A at the end. That was a great question. Yeah, no problem. So, um, so I'm going to introduce Joel now, and he's going to take over for the technology over. He's our king of hardware. So. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Connor. Hi, I'm Joel. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Um, uh, so I was uh, going to take you through the sort of the state of the art that we're using and the hardware that we're employing and kind of why and what it does, what the capability is. So let's just get right to it, show the next slide. Um, the business end of what we're using is a chip made by Texas Instruments called the ADS1299. And it is literally an eight channel EEG system on a chip. It's designed for low uh, voltage signal processing. It has a 24-bit uh, analog to digital converter, and it has a very, very low common mode noise insertion into the signals. This could get very technical, and I don't want to lose a lot of you for this, so I think maybe if we save some of the real nitty-gritty for questions at the end, then that would save some people from falling asleep during most of this, but um, I will go through and talk to you about some of the tests that we've done and on the uh, on the noise and on the signal quality. Uh, so next slide, please. So <clears throat> how low is low? The graph on the left here is from the data sheet for the device, and this is saying that we have uh, using a gain of 24. Uh, this is to measure the common mode noise. This is where we connect the input to ground, essentially, and run it for 10 seconds and see what kind of noise value we get. The, the data sheet says that the noise should be 0.15 microvolts. Our test, similar setup, 0.16 microvolts. So we're sort of right there where you'd expect us to be if we're doing everything correctly as far as the board design and keeping the noise low. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is an example of another longer uh, test of the noise of the device. And all this work, this research was done by our uh, research and developer at large, a fellow named Chip Audet, up in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, so this is the, the, the Y portion of the graph is showing the noise density in microvolts square root hertz. And here we are in the frequency domain, right? We have a very, very low noise floor up in the higher bands. In the lower band, where you expect to see noise in uh, ADC, we do see the noise creeping up in the 1 over F, but it only gets up to about 0.5 or so down at 0 0.001 hertz. So we're able to measure very, very low frequency signals, which has some application in EEG studies in um, PTSD therapy. I've read about probably a few others that maybe some of you know about, okay? Next slide. 
All right, and this is an example of the, um, the software graphical user interface that we're using right now. This is sort of, this is currently being worked on, but this is our stable go-to version. Um, we have a map of the placements of the electrodes, an FFT spectrum, and a time domain spectrum. Through this interface, we're able to turn on and off channels at the bottom. We'll do this tonight, and we can stop and start the whole thing over here. We have a subject, uh, Ison is donating her brain to us all this evening to watch her, her signals. And we'll get to set her up in the cap in just a few minutes. Uh, next slide. That's it? Oh, there we go. Okay, so here's the sort of the story of the evolution of this work. Um, the very beginning of it was last year, just about this time. I got a call from Chip up in New Hampshire. He was responding to a small business innovation research grant from the government, and he wanted to know if I would be willing to help him out for that. So I'm the hardware designer subcontracted to the person who was really running this grant. Our first prototype was released in September 2013. This appeared at the Maker Fair in New York in September. Second prototype came out soon after, actually late October, early November 2013. And our goal was to produce a third prototype in this winter and release it in the early spring. Um, our original design was built as a shield or Arduino because that gives us a versatile platform to use not only with Arduino, but there are more and more higher, uh, uh, higher speed, more powerful uh, ARM type chips that have the same form factor. So we're able not only to prototype with Arduino, but also prototype with something called a chip kit, with the Freedom Board from Freescale, with the Maple Board from Leaf Labs, and um, what was the other one? Oh, the Due. We also worked with the Due, which is another Arduino product. Okay, so it gave us a lot of tools to work with and tools for other people to work with. We're moving away, as you can see, kind of far away from the Arduino Shield design because we don't want to put people in a position of plugging themselves into the wall somehow. So we're going with a Bluetooth connection for data transmission and firmware upload, all that through Bluetooth. We'll have an SD card on board, and we'll also have a, um, uh, a microcontroller. And at this point, we are looking at the Arduino um, uh, at Mega 328 chip, and also the chip that the, the chip kit is based on, which is a PIC 32, 32-bit, 32 50 megahertz microcontroller that's got a lot of memory and uh, can do a lot more signal processing on board, if you will. Okay, next slide. And the great thing about this, this chip that we're using from Texas Instruments is that it's daisy chainable. So you can cascade them, and instead of eight channels of EEG, now you have 16 channels. So we're going to be also providing a daisy chain module that will just drop right on top of the main board, and then you double your channel count. Ta-da! Next slide. And here's a graphical description of how that works if you don't know that how eight plus eight Lots of brain sensing going on there. Next slide. All right, so it's time for the demonstration. And what we're going to do is we're going to set up Ison with a brain cap that is uh, made by a company called ElectroCap International. Okay, and this is the device that we're using for all of our internal testing because it's really easy to get on, it's fast, the electrodes wind up in just about the right place, and we can get up and running with it really good. We'll plug into our open DCI, which is running on an Arduino, and we'll show you the brain waves on the big screen. And also we'll do some demonstrations of uh, alpha and mu, eye blinks, and, um, and some other stuff. And while I'm setting Ison up, Connor will start to take some questions, because this will take a few minutes just to get the ball rolling. I got it, Justin. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to do like a Q&A while I kind of
if I interrupt people, I'll be describing something important that's going on. Do you have a sense about how much information you can actually read? Like, as you notice, it's doing something that's inside the skull. So when you're outside the skull with the cap, what, what do you think is the most sophisticated information that you can read? Sure, I think you're, you're getting towards like what's, what's the coolest end result that you can produce yeah, with way, a non-invasive EEG. Um, and I think the like probably the best answer is like time will tell. Um, but in terms of things that have been done with EEG or, or non-invasive brain computer interfacing, um, research have researchers have used um, EEG systems to detect motor cortex. So today you'll see Eisen demonstrate an alpha oscillation, which is really prominent when a subject closes their eyes. And that's essentially the occipital lobe of the brain entering into an idle state where it, it discharges or it, it fires at a frequency of roughly 12 hertz. And so the brain has all of these kind of default frequencies for different regions. And so another really popular one right now is the motor cortex, which is a strip of brain that runs from ear to ear. Um, and the reason it's really popular is because it's the part of the brain or the region of the brain that's responsible, or at least the origin of all movement in the body. And so what people have done is they've started to classify these signals to translate thinking about moving into a virtual object actually moving around the screen. So in the video that we watched of the examples, uh, there was the, the driving car and um, you know, the, the helicopter moving around. And so that, there's a huge um, software side solution there, which is the machine learning that goes into someone sitting down at a system and the system listening for a specific brain state when someone's thinking about a certain type of output, and then recording that so many times where you can compare a brain state to a baseline brain state, and then flip the switch where the system can now detect right versus baseline and left versus baseline, forward versus baseline, and then detect all four of those against each other and a baseline. So there's, you know, there's Machine learning is a huge aspect or a huge design challenge in this. But yeah, I hope that helps. Answer question. Sure. David. Good question. How much does this cost now? So the, the board itself without an electrode starter kit is 299 I think, or just under $300. And then the, with the electrode starter kit is 330 I think. The cap you have to buy separately, and I think the, the cheapest cap you can buy right now is around 400. So the system right now is, you know, if you want the cap, it's roughly around 800 dollars, or yeah, roughly around that. Um, but there's a lot of DIY alternatives to creating your own electrode network and putting it up there, or putting it on your head. So you know, when I was at Carson's, the way that I met Joel was I did a, I built a, a BCI baseball cap that had embedded electrodes into it, you know, and it cost me $30 to put that together. So that's what we're kind of hoping that when the open, or when the open source community gets their hands on this, they're going to create cheaper alternatives to expensive research grade caps like this one. Sure, in the back. How do you filter EEG from EMG? Um, great question. So EMG is muscle activity and it produces artifacts that can uh, obscure EEG signals. But EEG or EMG signals tend to be on a magnitude of 10 to 100 times more powerful than EEG signal, EEG signals, which are generally in the, you know, the single digits microvolt to 100 microvolt range, whereas EMG can be millivolts. Um, and so, a lot of times there will be uh, band filters or high pass filters or low pass filters to filter out. Uh, voltages above a certain level and that can be done hardware side or software side um, and so yeah there's a, there's a number of techniques to filtering the signal so you're just getting the data that you want um, and it can be done hardware or software sure. have, you ever, have you done studies yet of uh, meditative states on, on, with this, uh, we had one at uh, the Maker Fair yeah we had um, our researcher Chip who actually knows quite a bit about EEG. Um, he said he had never seen anyone produce like a meditative state. Um, and then at the Maker Fair with the, the Open VCI, the first version, we had some trained meditators sit down and he was like, yeah, I'm gonna give it a whirl. 
and apparently he was producing really low frequency bands. I think it's like in the in the four to eight eight hertz. Right. It's kind of like a deep sleep or meditate or not deep sleep or light sleep and meditation have a similar kind of right. uh, I think profile. it's theta theta profile. Yeah. So and he said that he was able to see it, which was pretty amazing. Is this system compatible with other platforms like hardware wise? Is it like Arduino and software wise? Like sure, so the right now it's it, the hardware code is, is built with Arduino. So we have an Arduino library that you can just upload. Um, and then our the first graphical user interface that we built was in processing, which is a Java library. Um, we're working right now on open frameworks or a C version of the same interface. There's a processing or not or a Python version that's out there now as well. Um, and so the idea is to build template frameworks in all of these different programming languages that people are comfortable with, which are essentially just ways of visualizing, visualizing and receiving the data in a, in a well-organized data structure, and so that people can choose or, or pick the language that they're most comfortable with to begin de developing their own applications around the hardware. So it's just passing a stream of data, right? Like, exactly. like the other stuff we did at a hackathon. Awesome. That's just serial. Okay. Yep. So right it's now. like that. Right now it's serial, but I yep. it's just receiving incoming binary code, and then the serial is converting on all the software end into integers that can be parsed and, and you you know, assigned to other values. You can always export to Android from processing. Huh? You can always export uh, Android app from processing now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the, what we're trying to work on now is really just setting up the the most bare bone, but uh, kind of the, the the lowest level building blocks, so that people you know have a very crude place to start from, but have access to all of the raw data. And so we're hoping that classifiers, that developers and research, researchers start working together to build some of these, like the motor cortex classifier or uh, meditation classifiers and things like that. Language so, learning classifiers. Yep. Okay. So there's, there, you know, there are commercial products that exist that do these things, except that the algorithms are proprietary, and so that's, you know, a big, you know, one of our missions is to make the entire data flow transparent, from electron, from electrode to the end result to the raw EEG becoming meaningful data. You know, we hope that people, when they start to solve these problems, post it through our forums and, and share and also work on perfecting them. And we find it hard to believe that a, like a small company can write the best algorithm for classifying meditation. So, yeah. Uh, Shall we? So we go to Parsons to work on this a little bit more? Like, is this you know, whole thing? So there's actually, um, Eisen's, Eisen and I are, are co-teaching a class next semester, which is a, collab, a collaboration with OpenBCI. Um, but the best way to get your hands on this as soon as possible is to donate through the Kickstarter, because we haven't released, aside from a few researchers that we have, you know, close connections with, we haven't re released the hardware to anyone, but just ma mainly as a safety precaution. So. You'll be also be notified of hackathons that Oh yeah, that's actually another great. You know, a, a huge part of our mission is is doing meetups and hackathons like this, except with more hands-on experience. So we hosted our first hackathon at ThoughtWorks um, about a month ago, and it was really cool. We had 30, 35 artists, developers, researchers there. Um, and it was a really great learning experience for us because we got to, for one, figure, it out, figure out how to get really smart people to try and learn this. You know, like if we're trying to lower the barrier of entry where we want high school students to be able to jump on board, then we, we need to be able to teach computer scientists from Columbia. So you know, it's like uh, so. It was a really good learning experience. Like, let's start with them and make them learn how to learn how to how to teach them how to use this, and then we can start working our way down. Well, in that sense, the computer science is a clumber of the low hanging fruit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this effort is not related to the school. Uh, no, this is a this is an external effort. It's just that we all met at Parsons, which was an awesome experience. So, um, are we ready to go, Joel? Yeah. All right. So let's do a let's do a live demo. All right. Ison's all rigged up. She's got a late. Uh, eight electrodes connected to her brain or through her scalp. All right, okay, so what was he doing with the needle? 
I'll, I'll say that and right now, actually. The needle was, uh, it's a blunt um, uh, a needle that I'm inserting a electrode gel into this cap. These little white plastic things hold the electrode, and it's like a cup. So imagine it like a little plastic cup inverted on her head. The electrode is all the way back in the bottom of the cup, so it's very far away from her scalp. This gel is kind of some, I don't know, magic salt stuff. You can pass it around if you want to see it. Please don't spill it. It smells like, like ultra play sound gel. Ultrasound. Probably something similar. Yeah. I'm not sure. I've never used ultrasound. But what that gel is doing is it's filling up the cap in the space between the scalp and the electrode to make that connection so that we can feel the electrons coming out of it. So now we're running the um, running this program and right now we're not implementing a 60 hertz notch filter. So I'm going to turn that on so you can see what the difference is when we get the filter going. So we should see that high frequency noise go away. And we've got Ison's brainwave. So Ison, close your eyes for a second, blink your eyes. So you can see on the top two channels, yeah. the eye blink artifact going by. And now grit your teeth a little bit. There, there's EMG artifact. You wow. see on channels three and four, they're more predominant. Of course, if she really grits her teeth, then it's like all over her head, right? Wow. Okay, so now she's gonna go for alpha. Close your eyes. And we'll see here the 10 hertz. This is the alpha wave showing up, and in those four channels that are on the back of the head, that's the occipital lobe, and that's where you'd expect to see alpha showing up when the visual cortex doesn't have anything to do, it just sort of goes into an idle state. And Ison's got really awesome alpha. Way to go, Ison! Okay, so the other thing we want still and hold yourself still, we should see something close in this area coming up, and you'll see in channels three and four, uh, on the time domain, a low amplitude waveform around 12 or 13 hertz, that's mu. And then what happens is if you move your hand, mu is subdued. Or if you think about moving your leg or whatever, mu is subdued. So this is how you would, for example, control a car with your brain if you're thinking about moving or not moving you're able to either produce or subdue the mu, and we can build a classifier or some other software algorithm that is able to figure out that you are doing that, actually. Right. Great job, Ison. Yeah. Uh, is there a math problem to solve or something? Oh, I know. Uh, Ison, do you do math? Yeah. <laughs> She's an artist. Why don't you uh, surprise her in some ways? Give her hiccups. Can you give someone? <laughs> I don't know. There's something that we could see some real. Think of the color of red. All right. Just think red. Think of the color of red, I see. Wow. She's got her eyes closed. Not so think of purple. Yeah. Think how colorful. Is this Poco Java? This is written in processing. So yeah, you, you can write Java, you can fix it. You really see movement. Yeah, look, this is... That's when she moved the stops. Look. Yeah, look at that. It's crazy. Wow. Wow. So that's, uh, that's not good, right? It's, it's, it's just a lot of movement noise. Yeah, that's so much better. Tell me a lie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a lie. You're 23. Yeah. Tell me the truth. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Do you think of I love you or I hate you? What's the difference? Uh, I just heard up with my boyfriend. <laughs> Can this work as a lie detector? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> uh, is this culturally determined or gender determined? Is what culturally determined? The brain waves and the mapping. I have no idea. I mean, I think because of neuroplasticity, uh, there must be some sort of cultural, social uh, depression that is reflected by the brain. There must be, because we know about neuroplasticity. I don't know about gender, per se. That's a tough one. I don't think I want to touch that one, actually. Definitely not good for yeah. investors. Oh, you say that's a difference? 
among its genders? Like, oh, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. that. No, 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 we have different and our theory is one of the biggest um, like yeah, it's like any other experts the, in the gender the differences? Or or a, a well, specific of differences of our thoughts. Uh, Should it imply something like that? Uh, the, there'll be individual differences, and uh, you know, because like everyone develops ever so slightly differently, and so you know, uh, electric four like will be getting more or less back, you know, backwash from like different parts of the brain just because everyone's you know, the more motor cortex is ever so slightly different so than anyone else's. So I mean, yeah, like there'll be differences within individuals that you can like compensate for, you know, be, uh, j just based on like messing around with it. And yeah, the differences between individuals might be, might not be any, you know, more than like the average ones between the genders. So it's not really so much a gender difference thing. You're, Necessarily, than a you know individual difference thing. Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's true. It, it, it is true that the, the placement of the electrode is super important in all of this stuff, um, and also um, uh, what we're measuring is really the effect of teeny tiny signals that are happening either very very deep or very very close to the surface. We're not measuring. We can't say okay, this electrode or or this signal is coming from this exact little spot in the brain. We're seeing like a uh, sort of an emergent property that the brain is outputting. We're seeing a very very large signals. We're not able to pinpoint exact stuff. So then, so maybe it's true. Maybe we are all the same, just a little bit different. But you know, guys is testosterone and girls is like progesterone. That's hormones. Estrogen, estrogen. Est yeah, estrogen. Tofu. Tofu, estrogen. <laughs> <laughs> Tofu, I know that. I know that there's a difference <laughs> between children and adults and elderly. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, like, for example, kids uh, stay in the theta stage um, during normal, you know, because theta is like semi awake, same, like uh, s not completely asleep, still alert, and if there's a like, creativity in play that happens in that wave, and so kids can be awake and be in that state, but adults are, uh, don't have that as much. Yes. Playful space. It, it, it's worth pointing out, there's a difference between asking the question, are there differences between the brains of men and women, which is already a hard question, but then can you see such differences with this technology? Mm -hmm. You might think of this technology as looking through the brain through a fairly blurry lens. There's only eight locations you can think about. Um, in a brain scan image, an fMRI brain image, you would have much higher resolution. Ultimately, you still wouldn't be able to zero in on the individual neurons. So this is kind of a coarse way of looking at the brain. It's very good in the time domain. You're getting a lot of samples um, every millisecond in a way that you wouldn't with fMRI. So there are different trade-offs with different technologies. When you're asking, can I tell the difference between a man and a woman, you're saying, through the lens that I'm looking at, can I detect the difference? There may be differences you can't tell with this lens. As far as I know, I don't know much about this technology. For most stimuli, you probably wouldn't see a difference between men and women. I bet if you showed naked pictures of women, you'd get a different response, even with this for men and women. Uh, let's focus That's on heterosexuals right. for a moment. That's for most weird. stimuli, you probably wouldn't get that much difference. It's interesting. You can tell. I have a few questions that can probably be answered right now instead of um, subjective ones. Um, first, personally, um, what is the that one is EEM, right? Where you can detect where the eyes are blinking and such. So you're actually using muscular rather than EEG. Well, the, the sensor is picking up any electrical activity. So, so is it always going to be a positive whenever the eyes open and close? Not or? necessarily. I can close your eyes again, blink your eyes a few times. It's gyration. That's the we can't see too much on these other uh, uh, Channel. placements, channels. But what would happen is our reference is the R position on the head map over there. So when she blinks her eyes, you can see the downward going movement of the signal in channels one and two. If um, there's a lot of hair in there, it's hard to sort of sort of see the rest of the signal, but sometimes I've seen the channels three and four will have an upward going signal when the eyes blink. That's because the reference is in between them and the signals are going opposite directions, if you will. So it has to do with the placement of the reference point that all of this stuff is getting measured against. And the reference point 
is actually on her skull? Or? Yeah, the reference point is the electrode in the R electrode, which is... So we're able to measure these signals because we're measuring them against another part of the body, essentially. So there's a reference electrode that all eight channels are connected to on, in this case, the P, the P input to the uh, amplifier, and the N inputs are all attached to various channels one through eight. Um, that's the thing that we were talking about trying to pull off, is if you can build some sort of an artificial intelligence or a classifying system that would be able to make this kind of determinations, then yes, you could. I mean, we saw the car being driven by the brain. Um, people have been able to hack into World of Warcraft with uh, EEG rigs and play with their Mu signals, play with their motor cortex, uh, and moving parts of their body to move around the virtual world. So you currently don't have a mapping from we don't have that yet. Just hold on. And then you. Yes. Um, yeah, um, no, nobody is saying that everybody's individual, but how fast do people learn you know, to like, control, control that? Is it? I don't know. Connor, do you know how fast people learn to control that? Um, I think it depends a lot. It depends a lot on the, on the algorithm. Um, the first time I was in an EEG was in a hotel room in Boston. I was getting a demonstration of a professional setup, and the software that was being run was uh, detecting a P300 wave, which is the wave that happens when you uh, consciously notice something that one of our um, commenters mentioned on the video. And the way the, the experiment was set up was there was a computer screen that had all the letters and all the numbers and all the command keys, and it would flash columns and rows of the screen randomly. And my job was to notice, consciously notice, when my letter that I wanted, or whatever it was, was lit up. And by flashing the rows and columns, I think it was about 30 times, the algorithm was, be able, was able to tell I was thinking of T, or whatever. So I spelled tight with my brain, and I did it in about 20 minutes. It, it went through one course of spelling a word that the computer wanted me to spell, we spelled water together, that was a predicted word, and then I spelled type right after that. So it was, depends on the algorithm. And there's a follow-up, do you see there being a market for just as a pure biofeedback brain training? Oh, absolutely, actually. absolutely. I mean, there's, there is a therapeutic uh, tool market for this. I mean, we know people who have uh, ADHD who have gone off drugs because they've gone and done neurofeedback, working with, um, uh, What's that? Video yeah, video games. games. Kind of video games. It's about concentration, attention, and meditation, this kind of stuff. But then we also know of uh, artists, dancers, athletes, musicians using neurofeedback to improve performance, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Uh, there's some supplements and drugs, especially the racetams that. Uh, that stabilize EEG readings. Uh, have you ever played around? Have you ever like played around with this stuff with, with your equipment? I don't know if I should say that I play around with drugs. No, we don't. I don't know what the drug is you're talking about at all. It's a legal cognitive cancer. Okay. Something about marijuana. Sorry, legal cognitive cancer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, we have not had a chance to do anything like that. We're, we've just been trying to get the regular old normal signals. <laughs> I think I got, Connor's going to answer that question because he's an expert in this field. Um, so, Emotive's first product, the EPOC, or the EEG, had, I believe, 14 sensors. Um, the biggest difference is that with OpenVCI, you have access to all of the data. And so, you don't need to purchase like an Enterprise Edition or an SDK Developer's Edition. You just, you just get the device and you're up and running with raw EEG 8 signals or 16 if you get the daisy chain kit. Um, and so, you know, that, that's really, I, it's hard to compare one versus the other because they're both 
EEG systems with a set sampling rate, you know, like the best way to do it would be to compare the technical specs of the ADS-1299 to the technical specs of Emotive. But really the, the mission that we're going for is total transparency and, and the idea of a concerted effort by open source developers to build these algorithms and keep them open. The real, real difference here is that you're trying to open up investigations into these questions of what can you do with this. So the real answer is we don't know exactly how much information can be gleaned from eight electrodes that are, or 16 that are outside the skull. And by making this open source, the idea is that more people will go at it, maybe have clever ideas about how to interpret this information. Mm -hmm. In exactly. scientific literature, it's not, it's not yet fully developed. Yeah. So in, in terms of analyzing the signal um, and converting uh, that analysis to some type of action by a computer, you know, some third party device, um, are, you, are you looking for, you know, the same signal multiple times, so let's say, you know, turn, turn right, and you're thinking it three times and looking for a repetition of the pattern, or are you trying to get it to work on, you know, the first instance of, of that pattern? Mm -hmm. A lot of it is statistical. Yeah, so there's, it, yeah, there's kind of a, so it's like a two-part problem. So when you're building a classifier, you know that you're going to be looking for something similar between different people, but the system that you build, everyone, everyone's brain looks different, and so you're going to need to build a system that is looking for something specific, but not so specific that it can't adapt to the user. And so, you know, that's why there's like the machine learning out or the, the challenge is very, very difficult. But yeah, it's, there's, there's a two, point, two part problem. You know, it's like the getting the default one that's searching for something broad and then training it enough times to be able to build a user profile that can then compare different trained actions to a baseline brain state. Is there anything about what you guys have so far that enables people to plug in different signal processing techniques of machine learning classifiers. I mean, how, how do I experiment with this? Um, so yeah, so there's actually, it's a good question because there's a lot of, there are a lot of existing open source signal processing platforms. Some popular ones are Brain Bay and Open Vibe. Um, and if you're familiar with, there's a project called the Open EEG Project, which is, it was started in the early 2000s, but it's a, it's essentially, it's similar in nature to OpenVCI, except that the barrier of entry is pretty high, so most people that have the you know, capability to do it are electrical engineers or very experienced engineers, and so we're really trying to drive that barrier down and get kind of like novice, amateur programmers involved. Um, but the, the, to answer your question, it's a simple, like the, all of these signal processing platforms that are open source or available have a certain data format, but they're still receiving raw EEG at a specific sample rate. And so all you would have to do is configure the Arduino code to output the data in that data format at the specific sample rate, and then it can be received by any existing signal processing platform. Can I ask a follow-up? So sure. I see that you're, you're outputting the raw data to uh, a text file. Mm -hmm. uh, so you guys envision like creating a library of, of these? Because really, you can if you don't have the hardware and you just want to play around with uh, classifying the data, you just have that, that raw data available across all the open source developers. That can be a, a, a big win too. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. That's a, that, that's a good segue into uh, kind of the future plans for OpenBCI. So you know, in the short term, we're focusing, at least right now, on hardware design and making sure that we get funded through Kickstarter. Um, but we have plans for the near future to build um, kind of a place for this data to, to sit and to find similar data. And so we want to build a social network around people who can crowdsource research and experimentation. So you know, we envision something similar to Stack Overflow, if you guys, any of the developers out there, where there's kind of a, a, a virtual accountability, you know, where you kind of earn your stripes to, to become a leader in the, in the social network. Um, and so if you're familiar with that system, you know, it, it filters out a lot of the spam and the crap and the people that just put on websites just because they think that no one 
knows who they are. Um, and so what we want to do is build like we want to build a a crowdsourced uh, network of people who can you know run a first experiment and say like you know what I only had the time and the resources to test this on five people, but here's how I did it. Here's my electrodes diagram. Here is the exact procedures that I ran, and this is what I was looking for. Um, put it online. I want. I'm querying, or I'm, I'm like, you know, asking this network to for a hundred people who are willing to run the same test. And because you know, if, if you get larger sets of data, you can be more liberal with your assumptions because of statistics and statistical probability that you know, if you run it enough times, you start to see uh, statistically significant patterns. And so we're hoping to crowdsource uh, the research and also the shared data through some type of online forum. On the hardware side, is are you? Getting past this cap, and maybe to a Google Glass or some other. Another great question. So you guys actually asked the two questions that are segues into the future of OpenBCI. So we're we're doing a lot of internal research into how do you make a cheap alternative to a four hundred dollar um, swim cap with electrodes in it, and so <laughs> so yeah, just uh, inject the uh, yeah. gunk into each. Right, so, so, there's, um, so there are many different types of electrodes. Um, there are electrodes that are best for EEG, so the, the best metal for conducting EEG signals, or at least this is like standard, um, like industry standard is silver, silver chloride. And they're, they're expensive, you know, like you can get a passive silver, silver chloride electrode for probably 12 to $15 if you're buying them in bulk, but if you need eight of them, that's already $100 for electrodes. Um, so there's, you know, we're doing a lot of internal research for dry electrodes. So a dry electrode is one that you don't have to apply some type of liquid to. Um, and then active electrodes. So there's an active electrode and a passive electrode. And an active electrode will actually amplify the, the signal at the source. And so since we're dealing with EEG signals that are really, really tiny, the impedance or the resistance of a wire will actually distort the signal before it comes back to the amplifier, or the, the, in this case, our ADS 1299. And so active electrodes are more expensive because you need to supply a voltage to the electrode and you need to have a little circuit there that's amplifying it. So there's a, there's a lot of design challenges, but what we're thinking about is building a customizable system where you, you either can buy the pieces and snap things together to create and design different types of headsets, not one with a fixed position. Um, but we're also looking at uh, 3D printing alternatives. So like we think that you know there's this huge craze for 3D printing, but there haven't really been any, people haven't really found something cool to do with 3D printing, but we think maybe that if the technology gets good enough, then you can, you know, and this would fit right in with the open source kind of movement behind this in that you could download a template file and just scale it to the size that you want to print it at, like small head, medium head, big head, and then just, Say, you know what, I kind of want to alter the model and just stick an extra electro here. You go into you know, a 3D editing software, and you just add the little piece in, and then take it to your like, local maker print store and, and print it out. Um, so you know, we have a few ideas on that. We haven't settled on anything yet, but definitely a, a next step. Sure. Uh, what happens when you like, close your eyes and then walk your eyes? What? Like, like, uh, pleasure, uh, um, like, uh, pleasure, and then, then, like, rub your rocks? Like, you're retired. Close them and rub them. Okay, like, let, like, so, you know, like, they get into, like, like, the, you know, listen, I don't say it, then they're going to say it. Close your eyes, and let's, let the alpha start to build up a little bit, give yourself a chance to relax. Yeah. Put the alpha right there. Okay, okay so now just rub your eyes. This must have been. Yeah, the muscle a lot, a lot of movement too. There's like the whole hands moving around. Yeah, and then and then everything got like much. But did you want me to see little stars? Um, yeah. Okay, hold on. That's different. One second. Hold on. All right. Oh, when you talk, there's a lot of. Yeah. Is there anything like? Well, actually, it's when I was like smiling, talking at the same time. That's a huge G. Like on six, seven, eight, it's like manually 
simulate is actually like a lot, there's like a lot less junk going on than, than yeah. like the idle state. Or were, awesome. you, were you seeing something? Yeah, I was seeing lines? like, yeah. Yeah. Well, well the, so then the visual cortex is then doing work processing mm -hmm. that incoming data, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Processing visual data? Yeah. I <laughs> oh, you'll be able to play it back. <laughs> if she adjusts the cap, like when you see, we don't want to touch it right now because it's got the gel and yeah. things and everything. And if we move it, then it'll miss well, a misalignment. But that's a cost scenario. You have the back, the headrest. People move around the head. Mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll yeah, these are the these are big issues that you know. As we we're saying, this this is really still kind of new. You know, it's really still a new thing. So there's lots of. We need to recalibrate once you touch it a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I do. Well, yeah. If we should we shift the hat around, then we definitely. And you have it. to regel me. Regel. <laughs> the gel doesn't go to the hair, right? It goes through the hair to the scalp. Yes. So she had to wash her hair. Well. <laughs> yeah, but that's not your problem. It's work better. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's a dry electrode that exists, so that could be an alternative. This is just a research grade hat cap. So yeah, but you imagine the practicality you use. Yeah, so you can design it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask you something in terms of the much larger picture. And the much larger picture is the, the source of where the funds came from, which is we both know as DARPA, and how that fits into <laughs> Where do you think the internet came from? Mm -hmm. yeah. Get over it. <laughs> it's like, you know. um, and, and the other thing is, um, how does that fit into the 10-year initiative of Obama's brain research? And where do you see this fitting in? And how do you see this um, moving forward in that context, especially in an arts school? Um, OK, as, uh, as far as arts school is concerned, what are you referring Parsons. to? It's not associated with Parsons at all. Okay. Um, there is a there is a class being taught next semester that is going to use some of the technology in the class, but it's not associated okay. with Parsons okay. movies. Right. Um, I I don't know for sure, but it must be uh, part of the President's Brain Initiative because it's a big brain project and it's, it's a brain thing. <laughs> um, and as far as the, um, the connection to DARPA is concerned, the uh, original call for the Small Business Innovation Grant specified that the, um, the output needed to be open source and it needed to be uh, commercialized and sold to people so that brain research could be crowdsourced. That's the whole idea. So that's what we're trying to implement. Um, we just finished phase one at the beginning of December. We're applying for phase two. In phase two, the goal is to do all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Innovate, bring the cost down, crowdsource data, produce a, an online hub, if you will, that brings researchers and potential subjects together to amplify the amount of information that's out there that people can, like you say, access without the need of any sort of real hardware to just to do signal processing to do research on, to innovate and explore the brain. That's the whole idea. Does that help? Yeah, I wanted to just get, you know, put this back in the larger context of where you're coming from and how you came to it and what it means, implications for the next one to five years out. I'm not sure what it means for the next one to five years. It's really going to depend a lot on um, how we're received by this larger community and this growing amount of people that may be interested. I mean, we're really hoping that we can get this thing funded, Kickstarter funded, so that we can start to get product out and see where we get taken by a community of researchers and artists and individuals who have questions about brain research that maybe researchers wouldn't even dream of making. What are you offering um, the investors on Kickstarter? We're offering them t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're there. It's a pre-sale. So we have uh, reward levels that are eight channel boards and then also the daisy chain 16 channel boards. 
um, with or without electrodes, because we know that there are a bunch of people who have their own electrodes already. Mm -hmm. Many of you may not, but as we're talking about people who are already doing um, neural feedback for therapy or whatever, they tend to have their own electrodes and ones they like and this kind of stuff. So we know people out there may not want to spend the money on electrodes. And how big are your DARPA grants? I'm sorry. Um, sensitive question. I like it. <laughs> I like it. The original phase one grant is about $20,000 that got us through a prototyping phase. Mm -hmm. We produced uh, a small number of boards that we could research with in-house and that our partners in New Hampshire and in um, uh, Arlington could also see and verify. So now we're at the point where we, we're out of that phase. Phase two is not going to kick in until probably next summer. Um, That'll be bigger or the same size? It'll be bigger. It'll be bigger. But there's, um, no but there's a lot more going on. It's about building a social net network site. It's about going through another round of prototyping to try and drill these costs down. Now, there are also, also, also to, to, to let you know where we're coming from and how we got here, we're using the ADS-1299 because that's what my client said we were using. So. Not, not the government decided this, but my client said, well, let's use this one. Look, it's an EEG system on a chip. And I said, that sounds great to me. <laughs> so this is where we're at. We're using this device. It's not a cheap device. <laughs> the chip itself is about $56 if you want to buy one. And if you want to buy a 1,000 of them, which is where you're trying to leverage uh, volume. volume, you're paying about $46 for one. So we are trying our best to Work a margin for the product that makes sense for us to create something that's sustainable while at the same time providing a product that's accessible for people to use that has high quality, uh, high quality data, but also has a lot of extra stuff that is really useful. There is a, uh, there is a way to detect uh, the quality of your lead contacts inside this chip. It's called a lead off detection. Every time you take a sample reading, the first uh, data board that you get contains information on the signal uh, connection quality. It also produces internal signals for calibration and uh, this kind of stuff. So it really is a pretty fancy thing. It's very useful. It's a, I think it's even if we end up in the future, three, five years down the road, moving away from this chip, it's a great tool to get out there to make accessible for people to use and play with. Yes. Hello. You don't, you don't have to answer this one either, because you'll eventually publish your schematics and I can answer it myself, but how much did you deviate from the app notes from the chip in designing your hardware? I didn't deviate too far, um, uh, and the app notes were pretty pretty accurate. Um, it's, I'm not publishing the schematic, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm publishing this, the schematic diagram, but I'm not publishing the actual design files because I don't want to give people the chance to inadvertently plug themselves into the wall. It's a, there's a real safety concern there, and uh, I'm not an electrical engineer by training, but I'm sure that the Electrical Engineering Society would frown upon that if I did that. Um, uh, so the hardest part about the whole thing is uh, creating a star ground pattern, if anyone knows about designing electronics. Um, and that's going to be something that's really specific to whatever situation you're in. I was designing around an Arduino, which is a weird thing to fit into. You know? Uh, what kind of electrodes does it come with? Does it come with, like, uh, like for, on the Kickstarter? On the Kickstarter, we're shipping it with um, bold uh, electrodes, individual electrodes, and uh, 10, 20 paste, mm. so that you can place individual electrodes where you want them. Mm. Uh, like, are they the ones that you have to, like, gel and stuff? Or? No, this would be a, a, a situation where you would take the electrode, it's like a tiny little cup mm. with a hole in the middle, mm -hmm. and you could, you would scoop it, up some paste. It's much more like a waxy paste, not like uh, this liquid paste. Well, and that still, sticks to your forehead or something. Uh, uh, like it's still a thing where like you have to mess with like sticky, something. That you still have to mess with goo. But, uh, we're all, uh, but this is uh, this is going to give you a high quality signal. We're providing you with a tool that's going to get you into real data that you can start messing around with. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and as Connor said, one of our goals is to explore and try to figure out a low cost active dry solution mm -hmm. that would be just as good, but we're not there yet. Yes? Well, do you see a scenario where this technology evolves from really monitoring brain waves to uh, a similar type of hardware being actually able to alter that? 
Uh, that's interesting. There's been a lot of buzz about this lately. I know that there was a talk that I couldn't get into because it was packed, but it was about this very sort of thing, which is uh, um, introducing signals to the brain to cause effect. And there are a bunch of different ways of doing it. One is transcranial magnetic stimulation. stimulation. Direct current and AC. Right, direct what current and AC. Direct current is where you have very, very low, low currents, microvolts. Uh, coursing along your scalp that in, can get into the brain tissue, I guess. And there's apparently clinical studies that prove that this affects something. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what also, it is, though. There's also a new uh, headset called the Focus that uses uh, direct current, and it's just like 1.5 volts, you know, 0.1 milliamp, or something like that, passing through a specific area that's supposed to help you with your brain function. But yeah, that all has to do with brain plasticity and kind of, you know, uh, suppressing certain areas so that your brain has to reroute and use areas of the brain that it usually doesn't use in order to, you know, do a specific function. So I think the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing this with us. So I wonder what's your business model? Is it profit or non-profit? It's with a profit the model. Profit model. And with open source, how do you protect your intellectual property? We don't. We give it away. Yeah. Okay, I see. That's the only thing that we protect so is our uh, our brand. But how do you make a profit if you give it away? We hardware. sell the hardware. Oh, nice. We sell the hardware. Yeah. And we give away the designs for the hardware and the reasons why we do it, so that we hope that someone else, I mean, this is sort of the, the big thing of open hardware, right? We hope that someone else comes along, makes improvements on it, and puts us out of business. That's it's kind like of the goal. You build a PC hardware or something like that, right? Like the hardware of the PC, you did the hardware for the... Oh, they wouldn't put you out of business. They'd just give you better ideas and you'd be right, exactly. Able to it's all about you're, sharing. You're being, it's all about sharing. being yeah. a little tricky when you ask. I am. Yeah, it's not, it's, it, it's cooperation to take a phrase from our guy from the government who brought us all to uh, the Maker Fair. It's not competition, it's cooperation. Yeah. <laughs> can, can I jump on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think um, we're in a really exciting time now where people are beginning to successfully monetize open source projects. You know, you look at Arduino and Raspberry Pi and... <coughs> Yeah, they're you know they're they're exploring uncharted tin, like we said, host hackathons and meetups and get people connected around um, around this hardware. But aside from the hardware sale, I would expect that you that you intend to amass a lot of data and be able to leverage that as well. True, but the we, we don't plan on closing any of the data up. So the the you know I think that goes against kind of both what what Joel and I are aiming right. to do with this long term. So the the idea is to make it so, if someone wanted to download the entire database and copy it and make their own and close it, sure. But you know, it it, it takes the, the wind out of the sails really. So it, we don't want to close it up and make money off of the data. Um, can they close it? Who is they? Someone who can copies someone it can close it. it. Sure. Can they? Sure, yeah. Sure, they could, uh, but it would be stagnant at that point. Anybody could take it and do anything they want with it. Yeah, the copy could be closed too. Unless you do like copy left or something. No, there's no, we can't stop. It's like yeah. a gift. You can't stop someone from doing something with it once you give it away. They just do what they want. But that's always there. It's always, you can't, you don't take it and it goes away. It's it's less, but it's less valuable every day that the open source uh, version continues. There right. are open source licenses that yeah. Exactly. David's an expert in that. He should tap it. He really knows his stuff with that. And he might be helpful. I didn't fully hear the question. What did you say? Referring to the GPU, you know, Free Software Foundation's uh, GPL license, which requires that uh, modified versions of software like that way retain that particular type of license. Lock it and be into being permanently Does this apply to data as well? Uh, I think that there probably is. I don't, don't trust me on this. Okay. So that there's uh, a similar thing. Interesting. Hmm. 
Go but back. The GPL is for software. But the GPL for software says that any other version that's not locked in. No, it says that, uh, you, uh, that if you take the software and modify it and you distribute it, you need to retain the original licensing which is open source. So that your modified version has to be licensed under the same open source type of license. Ah, so and if you start making money from that. It says nothing to do with money. Make all the money you want. <laughs> oh, okay. Nothing to do with money. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah, can you, can you speak a little bit more about um, you know, let's say you know this this develops a lot further. Um, you know, a lot of lot better algorithms are developed to understand um, you know the readings. Um, what, what do you see as um, as potential use cases that will drive this product further? Um, I think there are limitless possibilities for for the future of brain computer interfacing, but I think that. It'll definitely find its place in gaming and um, learning. Learning, yeah. Tracking attention, tracking focus, and optimizing productivity. Controllers. Um, I also think that it's going to be, it's really going to be big for, um, for uh, like as we said, like personal feedback. So neurofeedback and kind of understanding how how your stimuli and your environment affect your state of mind. I think it has a lot of potential for that, which is a really a, almost what I'm most excited about uh, is fu the future of understanding the way that our mind and our consciousness responds to our experiences. That's um, architecture. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah, I think you know, and when you when you bring that topic up, then it literally then the possibilities become limitless. So, um, Joel, I don't know if you want to touch on this too, because this is kind of a personal question as well. Any other questions? Anyone over here? Yes. Um, I, I, I have a question actually about like how um, the um, data, data could potentially used for like um, in, in, in like journals because like you know you, if you get if you have like a big database that, that everyone has access to like you know like like that's awesome and and, and it's totally real science because it's real knowledge but like um, like without uh, I, I, you know, uh, like with, with, without like um, an ethics board you know uh, doing stuff like under the um, supervision of like an ethics board that's like vetted and stuff like you can't actually. Like you, you uh, like there are some places where you know there are open data sets that you can uh, do um, you can you can publish studies based on that because it was still it did still go through a bottleneck of an ethics board and is there is there um, do you have like a model set up where like if people want to um uh, you use like their own personal experiments to um uh, you know potentially um, like publish their results in a journal for them to like you know have partnerships with universities that you know you do still like need to you know go through them to make sure that you know your stuff was collected like. Ethically, in general. Yes, you're right. I mean, this is something that we have to be <coughs> conscious of. We are aware of, and it's going to be part of what we're trying to trying to make happen. We want to um, we want to make a space that's really open that people can add to and feel comfortable with using the data that's coming out of it. Feel comfortable ethically providing data and also using the data. So yes, it's a great question, and these are the problems that we're going to be trying to solve. Yes. Okay, fun question. As a Google Glass user, this is something yes. I deal with a lot. Right. Whenever something is sexy and it's futuristic and it's popular, people become terrified of it. And they write articles about all the terrifying things that Scary Organization X is going to be able to do with it. What are those articles going to say about your product? I'm going to say DARPA and then you're terrified. I'm, I'm not sure what the articles are going to say about our product that will terrify people. <laughs> They're going to be, maybe they talk about hacking the brain. <laughs> yeah. I guess the correlation to it is like, what do you do about it? Like, how do you reassure the face? Um, you know, you, you just keep going. Yeah. You just keep going. You, yeah. And um, you're honest and forthright and, uh, you know, try to be ethical. And that's how, that's how you do it. You win in the long run. Yeah, I'd love to jump in on this one. Sure, go for it. Yeah, so, yeah, there's a lot of the ethical implications of interfacing the brain are, are um, definitely should be addressed. You know, there's a number of possible dystopic scenarios, um, but I think most of them are a result of the data and the technology being operated and maintained by a closed source. You know, like, the, the worst case scenarios of, of this type of thing is when most people don't understand how it's being used 
and a small group of people does and are harnessing the data for a personal benefit or security um, and things like that. And so that's why, like, you know, personally, I believe this, you know, Joel and I talk about this sometimes, but the, the only way to truly move this field forward in an ethical way is to make sure that everyone has the same level of access to it. Um, and so, yeah, transparency is paramount, but it's just, you know, that it's, you can't ignore this type of thing because the implications are so impressive and limitless. And so, you know, like you could say, oh, technology, future, it's terrifying, you know. <laughs> Uh, but you know, you might as well. Yeah, nice. He turns on his Google Glass. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. uh, yes. um, about a year ago, I attended your uh, brain hacking uh, I remember you. Are, and see the Motive headset, um, which has a closed system, we were, at that time we were not able to hack into it and interface it in any way. But um, have you been able to use uh, a, a, an open source uh, way of getting that information from the Motive? Consumer model headset? The only way to get all of the data out of the emotive is to pay the developer or researcher amount, which is I think you know in the six or seven hundred dollars. And then if you if you want to use it for a commercial uh, endeavor, you have to enterprise with emotive, and I think that's a few thousand dollars. And so there's you know there's a lot of barriers set up there where you're there's still strings attached. That's an example of the, the opposite of what you are trying to do. Yeah, and I'm not in any way trying to undermine motive. Like, I've used their technology and I've used NeuroSky, and I think they've been groundbreaking and, and you know, they've spearheaded up until this point the field of commercial and brain computer interfacing. So it's, you know, they're amazing. And I think that at this point in time, though, there's the field is expanding faster than one or two companies can handle, you know, and I, and I think that there isn't an open source alternative at this point, and I think that's why we have a market and we have a place to fit in, so. Can I ask one more time, what's that number four node up there? It's measuring, is it something specific? So four is just, is just um, an electrode that's receiving the electrical signal from generally this region of the brain. I noticed that your number four, as I've been watching it, doesn't seem to be going off as much as the other ones. Yeah. And I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if you're just yeah. thinking yeah. about a certain uh, thing, exactly. or if it you're like a contact, right thing. It could be a contact thing. Uh, but yeah, I'm a right-handed, mm -hmm. and that's my motor cortex. And also, I've been noticing that my that the three, that the electrode on this side, um, is activated when I move my eyes a lot, so I think hmm. that my left side of the brain is directing the movement of my eyes probably because I'm using this eye more than hmm. my left eye, because hmm. I'm right eye dominant. Huh. I notice it seems to also, what I think, at though. certain times it seems to move in a clockwise, so it was around. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That is it. We're researching brains right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Cool. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So, so if you can sign in for Culture Hub if you want to receive their mailings, please sign in. The board is here somewhere. Yeah, please. Okay. And thank you. If you guys have other questions, we're here to And contribute.